In 2023, the Biden administration started a new process that allows certain nationals of Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela to enter the United States under humanitarian parole. In an effort to address illegal entries to the United States and certain dire circumstances in these countries abroad, the Biden administration started this process to allow persons from those countries to temporarily enter the United States and seek work permit. So if you are a national of one of those countries or you are an immediate relative of a national of one of those countries, then listen here to see if you might be able to benefit from this parole program. For starters, to benefit from this program, you must be outside of the United States. And as explained, you must be a citizen or national of Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, or Venezuela. That said, if you are not a national of one of those countries, but you are the spouse or child of someone that is from one of those four countries, then you may also be able to benefit and roll under this program with that individual. So let's take an example and let's say that you are a citizen of Mexico, but your spouse is a citizen of Cuba. If your spouse is applying for parole under this program as a citizen of Cuba, then you could also benefit as the spouse of that Cuban national under this program. But keep in mind that that is only the case if your spouse is only a citizen of Cuba. If your spouse has dual nationality, both being a citizen of Cuba and Mexico, then your spouse is not going to qualify and neither will you. And remember that in order to benefit as the child of someone that is a national of Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, or Nicaragua, then you must be unmarried and under the age of 21. In addition to meeting the citizenship requirement, you also have to have a sponsor in the United States that actually gets this process started for you. Now that sponsor does not have to be a US citizen and the sponsor does not have to be related to you, but that sponsor does need to have certain types of immigration status or is maybe a parolee or with deferred action. So for example, that person could be a US citizen, a permanent resident, it could be someone that is an asylee or a refugee, it could be someone that has temporary protected status or maybe DACA. So there's various levels of individuals that can start this process for you. This sponsor does have to be able to document their status. They do have to be able to pass a security clearance and they will have to show that they have the financial means to support you during your temporary stay in the United States. Now, if that sponsor can't show that they have enough themselves, then they can get additional persons to join in with them to show that jointly they have enough to financially sponsor you and any family members coming to the US. And keep in mind that if it's not just you coming, but that you have a spouse or other children that are coming with you, then the sponsor has to file a separate I-134A form for each individual that's coming to the United States. For the sponsor to start this process, they have to fill out that I-134A form. And to do that, they have to go online to the US Citizenship and Immigration Services website, the USCIS website, and create an account under their name and submit that form. Remember, there has to be one form for each person that plans to come to the United States. They'll fill out that form with their information and with your information, and then they will provide supporting documents showing that they have the financial means to support you. In completing this form, the sponsor is actually agreeing to receive, maintain, and support whoever it is that is entering under the humanitarian parole process. So they must provide specific reasons or explanations for how they're planning to do that. So for example, let's say that you have a friend who is with temporary protected status in the United States and they are willing to be your sponsor. Let's say that this person makes $20,000 a year, which is not enough to support you, your spouse, and your child. So that person that's agreeing to sponsor you, while he or she can actually complete the form, the form I-134A, him or herself, that's not going to be enough money. So that person can, for example, go to a community organization, maybe a church or a business that is willing to provide additional support to help your family once you arrive here. So maybe you have a church that's willing to provide um, a place to stay once you arrive. Maybe you have a business that's willing to support you with $500 a month until they can provide you a job once you get your work permit. So those support letters and evidence of that housing and that financial support must be submitted with the I-134A application so that it can be considered by USCIS once that form is actually filed. Once that I-134A has been filed online, the USCIS is going to review it and determine whether or not it meets the qualifications to be approved. 
They're also going to run a background clearance to vet the sponsor to make sure that this is someone that can actually bring an individual to the United States and they're going to determine whether or not it is in their discretion approvable. So let's assume that they, re they have reviewed this, which can take several months at least. Then they're going to say, yes, you're good to go. Uh, let's move on to the next stage. And then what they'll do is send you, the person that wants to come to the US, an email with instructions about how to set up your own USCIS online account. Once you've created that online USCIS account, you're going to put in your biographical information and confirm that what is there is correct. In addition, you're going to affirm that the qualifications that you have stated are yours, such as your citizenship, are true and accurate and that you have the required vaccinations to enter the United States. So if you don't have those required vaccinations, such as for measles, polio, and COVID-19, but you're going to go through this process, then go ahead and make sure that you have those vaccinations and you have the proof of having received them. Once you've completed that online USCIS account, you are going to receive further steps about how to download the CBP-1 mobile application, which is necessary in order to complete this process. And remember that as all of this is going on, make sure that you are regularly checking your CBP-1 app, your USCIS online account, and your email in case you receive any important updates or information from immigration. So once you have downloaded that CBP-1 app, you're going to fill it out with your personal information and then take a photo of yourself and upload it to that. Once you've completed all the steps on the CBP-1 app, then it's going to go to CBP, which stands for Customs and Border Protection, to make a final determination about whether or not they will issue you a travel authorization to enter the United States and seek parole. So the way that this works is you will be given a 90 day window, assuming that they authorize your travel to the United States. And during that 90 day window, you must fly into the United States to an internal port of entry. And it's actually there in the United States at that airport that you're seeking the parole. Once you have flown into the United States and you're at a port of entry at an airport internally, then it's there that you're going to talk to a CBP officer who is going to run additional background checks on you by taking your fingerprints and is going to ask you about your reasons for entering the United States. Now keep in mind that this is a humanitarian parole. And so they're looking for significant public reasons or humanitarian reasons that would necessitate that you come to the US temporarily. Now this can be any number of reasons. So definitely have this figured out before you enter the United States. If it requires any documentation or explanation, then have that as clearly marked out as possible so that you can easily express it to the officer in a short amount of time. So for example, maybe you had children that because of the circumstances in your country, were no longer able to seek an education. Maybe you weren't able to express your uh, political opinions or your religious beliefs in your country. And so you're coming to the US temporarily while the government works out their issues, or maybe because of the political situation or civil strife in your home country, you weren't able to continue working there or you lost your home. So think about the reasons specific to you that you need to leave your home country and enter the US temporarily and be able to clearly explain that to the officer at your entry point. It is there at that time that the officer will determine whether or not to parole you into the United States. So assuming that they do, then they will parole you in typically for two years or a period of up to two years. And during that time in the US, you can live and work legally. So I would suggest that as soon as you're paroled in, you go ahead and file form I-765, which you can do through your online USCIS account. And that form is how you apply for a work permit, which should come pretty quickly so long as you go ahead and apply for that once you enter. Remember that once you enter the US, you still need to be available to immigration and in a way that they can contact you if they need to about your case. What that means is, is that if you change your address, your phone number, or your email address, then you need to update immigration about that. So you can easily do that now through your online USCIS account. So just make sure you do that timely so that if immigration has any important notices to send you, maybe it's to your benefit, maybe it's about an automatic extension of parole or the ability to apply for a renewal, then you need to be able to receive those notices. So even if you do have a sponsor in the United States, and even if you are a citizen of one of these four countries, you might not be able to come to the United States if you fall into a certain category of individuals. So if you are someone that cannot pass the security clearance, or if you are someone that's unable to demonstrate that the US government should exercise its discretion in your favor, 
if you have been ordered or removed from the US in the last five years, if you are someone that is subject to a bar based on a prior removal order, if you are a citizen of Venezuela that came into the United States illegally and not at a port of entry after October 19th, 2022, if you are a citizen from Cuba, Haiti, or Nicaragua that entered the US illegally and not at a port of entry after January 9th, 2023, or if you are a citizen of Cuba or Haiti and you are interdicted at sea after April 27th, 2023, or if you are under the age of 18 years of age and not traveling with a parent or legal guardian, then you are not going to be able to enter the US through this humanitarian parole process. Otherwise, this humanitarian parole process is a great option for a lot of individuals, and I really encourage you to look into it. Just remember that it starts with a sponsor in the US creating an online USCIS account and filing that form I-134A. So good luck to you. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.